How about the next part of the scenario of the official response from the Fed and others in the monetary world to say that they're trying to be firm in, in attacking uh, in, in their response to to uh, attacking inflation? Do you think that their response is actually meaningful and do you think it's going to have a meaningful effect or is it just window dressing because they can't really take stronger action because of the weakness of the economy, etc.? So I think they can take action around the margins. Uh, and I think we're seeing that show up in, in the housing market, for example, uh, how that impacts, uh, you know, mortgage rates and things like that. You know, is this partially from private market forces and then partially from those kind of more central forces. Um, and I think, you know, basically they have a number of tools to kind of rein in demand. Uh, and in their view, they want to try to use them moderately. Uh, but of course, if you look at the historical track record, uh, you, you know, soft landings are rather rare. Uh, in, in U.S. you know uh, economic history, right? Usually they tighten into a recession uh, because they, you know, during the loosening phase, they basically encourage uh, debt accumulation, and then they tighten the screws on anyone that, that actually took out debt uh, in that environment. And so I think we're I think we're seeing that play out now. We're seeing a cooling off in the housing market. Uh, you know, we're seeing some uh, softness in the labor force uh, around the margins at least. So especially when you look at initial uh, jobless claims each week. Uh, labor force participation, job openings. Uh, ever since March 2022, we've seen kind of a, a softening in there. And so I do think it'll be quote unquote effective around the margins for, you know, temporarily rating in inflation. But I think it, it comes at the cost of either, a, you know, significant economic slowdown or an outright recession. Uh, and I think that that's kind of sort of the environment they're in now. You know, my kind of base case is that, you know, so we've had two quarters in a row of, uh, you know, negative real GDP growth. Uh, it's a little tricky because we, we came off such a sugar high. Uh, and so, for example, most recessions, not all, but most recessions, they also go, uh, you know, negative year of year real GDP. Uh, uh, we, haven't, we haven't hit that threshold yet. That's kind of like another arbitrary threshold. Uh, the, the very mild 2000s recession actually didn't quite hit that either. Um, so, but like so far, we have not kind of reached that threshold. Um, but I think that if this if this kind of trend continues, I think we we can kind of trend in that direction. And you could certainly have a kind of a you know like a double dip recession where you have say two negative quarters and then a slightly positive quarter and then another negative quarter, and you can kind of like you know bounce along this weak path. Uh, but so far, the data is still deteriorating. You know, basically, rate of change data is still showing overall kind of weakening prospects when you look at pmis when you look at uh you know pro like producer prices paid basically we're seeing a, a disinflationary impulse but not really for good reasons more so due to the demand destruction rather than uh you know the supply constraints easing for people who've been riding a very long bull market some people say 40 years uh, of not only stocks bonds real estate and we have with the baby boom generation uh, aging ending uh, their their uh working career, late career stage, starting retirement, trying to start retirement, hoping they can start retirement. There's significant concern on many people's parts is what do they do if <laughs> the baby boomers all exit the market at the same time, uh, in the same you know time that the markets are already showing some softness as you're describing. Do you have any thoughts about the impact of this generational uh, demographics on what's going to be going on for the next several years in the markets? So I think that'll be a multi-year story. I, I don't think that's going to be kind of a, a, a price driver in any kind of one single quarter. Uh, but I do think that that's going to be a, a pressure, uh, a negative pressure uh, that was not there uh, in, the, in the prior stage of demographics. Another thing I'm looking at is, you know, at the end of 2021, if you look at stock market capitalization to GDP, uh, it got up to around 200%. Uh, if you look at, for example, the Wilshire, Wilshire uh, 5,000 compared to to GDP, um, and that's a, that was a record high uh, when it reached that level. And you had a combination of you know interest rates were driven down super low. You flooded flooded the market with stimulus, um, and I, I think that was probably a, a high water mark that we're not going to see for quite a while. And that doesn't actually mean that the stock market can't hit nominal new highs, uh, but I do think that the stock market relative to GDP. Uh, has probably hit, uh, you know, kind of pretty structural highs. It's it's hard to envision a, a set of forces uh, kind of bring that up again because that was kind of the culmination of you know four decades of falling interest rates all the way down to zero, and then you had that absolutely huge uh, you know kind of fiscal and monetary impulse together. 
Uh, there was kind of the end of a, a long-term disinflationary cycle. You had oil go negative, so there's no, you know, at the time there was no pressure from from commodities until you know, kind of the end of the year. And so I think that that that's a risk I'm looking at is that, you know, whether or not we hit nominal new highs, I think that forward, say, you know, five to ten year returns for the S&P 500 in inflation-adjusted, you know, returns are going to not be great. Uh, going forward, because I think we're in more of that kind of sideways band uh, going forward. We have a question here that relates to this demographic question specifically for for Europe, though. Uh, the Klaus 3001 asks, demographics in Europe are horrible. How will they pay the debt with a shrinking workforce? And it's true, they're, 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 not, they're well below replacement rate, and I think in every European country at the moment. Yeah, we see that especially uh, problematic in, in Italy because you have over 150% debt to GDP and they have, uh, you know, a labor force that's like, I think, you know, declining as fast or faster than Japan. Um, and so I think I think basically in Japan and a uh, bunch of Europe uh, and the United States, for that matter, I think that the debt levels as they currently exist are not going to get paid back in real terms. And so even though a number of central banks are trying to raise interest rates, especially the Fed, uh, I think that they're not going to raise rates to the level of inflation and that we're still going to be in a period of, of, for the most part, now there could be brief ex- exceptions where they get it above it, but I think for the most part, we're going to be in an environment of having rates below inflation for quite a while, uh, you know, especially on the short end um, and it probably also includes of the longer end. And so I think that part of the way that that that, that gets handled is through all the owners taking a haircut in, in real terms and basically losing purchasing power um, by holding uh, that debt long term. I mean, they can still get trading opportunities out of it as, you know, interest rates go up and down. They can get price appreciation uh, if they trade it well. Uh, but I think as a long term holder perspective, I don't think sovereign debt uh, in developed markets is the place to be for quite a while. Yeah, uh, Rick Rule, uh, tongue in cheek, refers to that as return free risk. That it's just crazy when you when all you can get is a negative real return from sovereign debt and basically anywhere in the world. Um, speaking of geopolitical. Uh, risks. Uh, Mike asks, what leverage does China have given that they own trillions in U.S. debt? Would it be enough to deter the U.S. from engaging in a Taiwan conflict? When I say men- men- mentioning geopolitical, you talked about the uh, the stress, the real energy crisis in Europe, and I assume the reference was to that that Russia holds the, the handle to the faucet that can be turned off and, and, and they'd have no gas, natural gas to make it through the winter kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, the issue with Europe is that, I mean, they're, if you look at their natural gas price, uh, it, it went vertical even before the war, uh, kind of the end of 2021 period. Uh, and it's gotten worse since then because obviously now there's a lot of geopolitical risks. Basically, you know, they were very, very reliant on Russian gas, both for heating and for electricity generation uh, and, and, you know, all sorts of inputs for things. And that's a big pressure now. And the, w- one of the ways that they alleviate that, they can get some more LNG, uh, they can burn more coal. Um, they can, you know, reverse some of their nuclear plant closings and things like that. But some of those actions push up uh, prices for the rest of the world, right? Because if they're getting more LNG shipments, uh, that means less gas for other places. Basically, there, you know, there's, there's people that are naturally arbitraging that. Um, and then the fact that they have, to, if they end up burning oil and coal, which is what they're doing now, that also puts up pressure uh, on prices. Um, when we look at China's leverage, um, you know. I wouldn't describe their trillion, you know, they have roughly a trillion dollars in U.S. treasuries, uh, more or less. Uh, you know, we can remember that back in March 2020, during the COVID crash, um, there was an issue where foreigners started selling treasuries. So the treasury market broke um, alongside the stock market, which was unusual because normally when the stock market's going down that much, people flee into the relative safe haven of treasuries. And at first, people were doing that until it got so bad that the foreign sector and uh, risk parity funds um, had to had to kind of unwind in a disorderly way, uh, and when that happened, the Fed came in and bought a trillion dollars of treasuries in three weeks. Uh, you know, they they ended up doing multiple trillions of dollars in total QE, and so compared to China's you know abil- ability to sell up to a trillion dollars in treasuries, uh, I think that's something that could be absorbed. Uh, but I think that there are other there. Are, there are much bigger risks, uh, you know, between these two countries. One is that much like how Russia had their reserves, um, you know, frozen, uh, China is actually vulnerable to having their reserves frozen. Um, so that, that's a risk on their side. A risk on our side is that China can, you know, nationalize a lot of our 
companies manufacturing facilities or otherwise cut us off and that's you know that's a much bigger problem than than just selling you know half or all of their treasury stash in kind of a disorderly way um so i you know i think luke groban described it well uh, a fellow analyst he, he pointed out that you know lehman was like a 300 billion dollar 600 billion dollar balance sheet Whereas China, you know, it's like a multiple tens of trillions of dollar balance sheet. So basically the, the interlinkage between these these two countries is so great that they have they have very significant ways to hurt each other, uh, even more so than, than some of the ways that, you know, Russia and Europe, for example, have ways to hurt each other.